I'm glad you're here to share that moment with me. Good morning, folks. It's a Saturday morning and we're having a bit of a family DIY day. Let me give you a bit of a look at what we're going to get up to today. Right, it is a uh, Saturday morning family DIY task, i.e. delegate to children. Good we'll, to get them involved. We'll we hide can. out here. We haven't been able uh, to. But... We have a new technique with our insulation. It's the, uh, the deep pan. The deep pan. It's got to be a deep pan. What's the pet hate with working with PIR? Well, it's not the most environmentally friendly stuff, but the worst thing about it is the fact that the dust gets everywhere and you often need spray foam and stuff doesn't fit and it's just nasty stuff. One more? Yeah. Oh, nice and dry at least. Well, we had a little play at this yesterday just by marking it up. I've now this morning made a jig. See the screws are sticking yeah. through, so they should hold it. Oh. I uh, didn't have any shorter screws. Are you sure that's okay? It doesn't pierce the insulation and make uh, it... Well, it does. We've got another whole layer of insulation after it. So that batten's going to sit on the outside. This is just me being stingy because I didn't want to cut a whole sheet down. Okay? Yeah. And then just give it a tap. And those two screws will bite in. Uh, no. uh, well, just do a little bit. Cut through the first layer. Really focusing on the... Nice to see your hair dangling down, ready to be caught in a pizza cutter. Wait for the trolls. Wait How will it get trolls. caught in I'm joking, I'm joking. I'm joking. Well, and then you're going to run it through now. So of course the worst thing about this insulation is the dust. And I, I kid you not, there is not a single grain of insulation coming out of this. Next pet hate of PIR and rigid insulation, you end up with offcuts that you simply cannot use. Fortunately, in our situation, we do actually need something to go in from the soffits. And I can cut this into the same width strips as this and tuck it in with the little offcuts of the tape. Robin, I think, mentioned it as well. There's certain joist spacing that if you can get away with that in your construction, you can minimize your wastage. Going surfing. Yes, it is. Right. So have you got your technique sorted? Yeah. Really hard, push it hard. Push it as hard as I can. How's it going, team tape? Yeah, uh, it's okay. We've made up a thing. Do we need to trim or not? Uh, no, I think not. Yeah, yeah, I think.
your rock. No, my... That's a funny looking rock. It's not a rock, it's my lovely thing. And why do you and use that? Because it, it sort of flattens everything out more and puts it on there. And then I come around here and I start doing it. Nice and hard. Oh, it's so nice, all stacked up, girls. Yeah, I did that. So nearly all of our rafters are now even and uh, all the spacings are fine. The one on the end and the one on the other end are a little bit wider. I think the sensors are about 620 or something like that, just because of where the trusses fell. We can do those ones right at the end, but for the majority we need... How many did you work it out to be? 20? Uh, 22. 22. So we're not putting any tape on the end, simply because it's going to be butt jointed to another one, so we'll just tape with a foil tape over the ends. Right, we gave ourselves, I think, two hours to get what we could done. We've done enough for one whole side of the building. However, because we've got a three metre stretch from the eaves all the way up to the ridge, there is another little 600 section to go in after. But we want to achieve something today, so we're going to get all these up, and then we can slot that bin in after. You can see up here where we've got those rafter clips, the same ones we use on the truss. So, because we install them internally, structurally that's fine, but if we put them on the outside, we could have carried this insulation over the internal wall, you know, the internal face into the eaves, and that would have just made sure that it was continuous with the wall insulation. Instead, what we've had to do is butt it up with the flanges of the clips. This one's still gonna be tapped up and down a bit, so it'll be tight to the OSB, but arguably this is not great because we want this to carry on over, but it can't, it terminates into here. But what we've got is all those offcuts, so we're going to tape them up with the expanding gapo tape, and we've got no soffits at the moment, so we can come up and we can fully insulate on top of our stud wall. As you might be able to tell, it's a different day. It's cold and it's wet and it's miserable. And I really should be finishing half of the roof today, but well, we just had to adapt. So I'm almost there because, well, I've got two more sheets left outside in the rain. And this tape does definitely not stick to uh, anything wet. All the others are up in the barn and I'm just, I'm gonna call it a day in a minute. But let me give you a bit of a walkthrough because it's, kind of going to plan. I'm kind of enjoying the process. It's definitely not as enjoyable as uh, certain things in building, but it's one of those things that's got to be done. Now, firstly, we changed our method of cutting to attempt to use the pizza cutter method. Now, 
I'm not completely sold on it. I like the idea because there's zero dust. Um, zero dust means it's safer and healthier to work with. And it means that the tape that we're using will definitely stick. As soon as there's any dust or moisture on the boards, it becomes completely useless as tape. Um, so that's worth bearing in mind. And we probably changed techniques and since we uh, started out. So what I'm doing now is taking off the release paper on both sides, sticking one end, giving it a little tug this end, tacking it down there, and then working along. And I just find that that's an easier way to do it, which makes entire sense to me at least. Um, and I've dried the top few inches on each side where there might be, the, just the nature of it being foil. Um, when you get droplets on it, it just takes ages to dry and you can wipe it down, but it still stays a little bit wet and greasy. One of the big plus points is that you don't have to be anywhere near as precise with your cuts. Obviously you want to be pretty close, but um, the tape does help you quite a bit in that respect. So where you're not able to cut all the way through and you're scoring it and snapping it, you can only really do that if you're using this tape. I know a lot of people cut and snap this insulation, but it's not a good way to do it because you never end up with it tight to your timbers and you're then squirting in foam. There should be no reason at all to use any expanding foam in this project, he says. There might be a tiny bead that I might put at the junction where I'm feeding these blocks in, which we'll probably do in a future video because it's wet. You can see these are the offcuts that we had from cutting the boards in half. And I've taped up with the offcuts of the tape as well. And these are gonna be fed in from the outside on a ladder up through the gap because we've got no soffits in yet and then pushed against the ceiling boards. And um, what that'll do is it won't be, I haven't cut an angle on them, but we're only 12 degrees on the roof anyway. It'll butt nice and neatly to these. So there potentially is a tiny gap there. Um, not a gap to outside, but just a, a little void. It'll be on the warm side and it will be above the insulation of the wall, but it might be worth just putting a little bead in there. And that might stop these shifting as well. As far as the mess goes, way, way less dust. I've, I've used the saw for a few cuts, just when I'm cutting smaller boards down. And you've seen, I've now started fitting in the second piece that takes me up to the ridge and with that I need to cut it down to they're almost square those blocks but where it joins and I've got one touch in the other the tape has become quite useful I'll show you I've done three different methods here just because I'll do the experimenting so you don't have to and I'll show you what's happened okay so here's a look we've got a nice snug board going right from the eaves all the way up and then I've had to put in this pretty much 600 by 600, or almost, um, block. Now you can see that it's just butt jointed tight together. And I was just gonna put a bit of foil tape over that before we start the next layer of insulation. But I can't see daylight through there, but there is definitely a small gap, maybe two millimeters. I simply cannot close up, especially now because I can't get a hand up the other side to push this down at all. It's as tight as it could be. So the first one I tried was this one and I ran tape down the side as normal, but then I just followed the tape around the corner and back up the other side. What that did is it ended up rounding the corner slightly. Then it needs to be tapped up a little bit more. But if you see that board here, it's just rounded that. So it almost creates a hole there. So in actual fact, what I found to be the ideal solution is just to put the tape on one board and just butt joint it in the corner. So you can see there, I've cut it, turned the other way, put another run in up that way. And by doing that, you end up with a nice sharp corner and very, well, zero gap. At the end of the day, there's no point in spending all this money on expensive insulation, taking all that time, and also spending money on things like that tape if you're not gonna use it in the best way possible. And I think even if you were just being a bit slapdash and putting on the tape in the wrong way, you're not, you're not really getting the best out of the product. And I don't think how many times it, that PIR boards have just been fitted loosely and what you're gaining in insulation value in those 
bits where the insulation is, you're probably just losing completely by all the gaps either side of it. And I know when we came to do the loft insulation at the last house, the amount of kind of expanding foam you have to use, and then the expanding foam probably only goes in 20 mil, so you still end up with a gap behind. So I can see the attraction. I'm still not gonna go overboard, I don't think, on using rigid insulation in the future. Uh, but if I do have to use it, I think I'll go with the tape, albeit that the cost is quite prohibitive at the moment, but I don't know, I guess you just have to factor that in. And no doubt the calculations would say that after 10 years, you've probably saved that much money in energy or, you know, it might not even be 10 years if it's a, a big job. So I don't know, you've got to uh, do that decision making for yourself, but it is a case of just working out how much it is for a board and then let, I don't know, I'm going to have a look and I'll put the price on the screen of what the going rate is for a board of 100 mil PIR and then what it is with the same amount at 600 sensors buying gapo tape. So you'd end up with four runs of gapo tape to each side of each half, if that makes sense. And while we're at it, and I'm sharing on that side of things from a cost and waste perspective, I mentioned earlier in the video, I think, even though it was last week, that you can set your centers at a particular distance to make the most of your insulation. Now, if we're using 60, or sorry, 600 millimeter spacings here, which is uh, 24 inches, then you'd think, oh, well, we're pretty much just cutting the board in half, which, you know, minimal cuts, fine, but actually, you end up with this much wastage on every single board, which you have zero use for, unless you happen to have a little gap in the eaves to fill. Um, so that is a waste, a complete waste. And imagine that over 30, 40 boards, or whatever we had to buy, you'd be, you know, you'd be talking probably a couple of hundred quid of waste. So if you can, then you can set your timbers at 450 millimeter sensors and therefore your gap that you need to cut your boards to, which by the time you put the tape on will fill, uh, you can just cut a board straight in thirds, no waste, and well, just no waste. Obviously you've got to be using the tape to do that because otherwise your boards will be loosely fitting and wouldn't work. So, um, you know, Again, it's one of those decision-making things, but if your centers don't matter structurally, um, you know, if you wanted to reduce them down, uh, you probably end up with two more rafters over this whole length. Um, but then on the flip side, you might want to ma um, match up with centers for other building materials and 450 might not work. So that's why we didn't go that route for the floor, because at one point we were going to try it. Come on, why are you looking like you're too fat? It's not good, is it? Ah, oh, crumpets. Cut them too big, haven't I, I bet. But we're not taking off. I'm glad you're here to share that moment with me. Well, that's a pain. While I'm at it, I'll share another little bugbear. Where we've got this stud wall here, it hangs off the side of that joist a little bit. So what we need to do is get the board over the top of it. But they're so rigid, and because they're quite thick, you just can't do it. So that board there, we're gonna to have to cut down the middle, I think, and then rejoin. And that's what we had to do at the other end yesterday. Now I haven't joined them back together now, but you can see there's a step up there. So this board goes over the top of the wall, which is great thermally, because it goes over and basically sits on top of our wall insulation. But in order to do that, again, you can't just get it over and up. It's not forgiving enough for that. It's so rigid. And even with the foam, uh, the tape didn't help. So what we had to do is just literally cut down the middle, put one piece in, and then angle them both almost to, to get them up in place. So they need to be knocked around a bit. But again, it's just one of those things that I don't think there's any other way we could have done that other than trying to do it in 50 mil in two layers, something like that. And then you'd be able to get it up and over. 
nearly all done, probably another couple of hours just to get all of this first layer in. And then the next insulation video, we'll be discussing how we're gonna make this far more thermally efficient than it is. So rather than go to all this, you know, effort of making all our ceiling nice and snug and insulated and just leaving those and putting our ceiling onto there, we need to get another layer of insulation below. And I've done this a number of times on the channel, but some of you might be new to the channel and it's gonna be a little bit different this time because once we've got that insulation underneath, we'll put some washers and fixings to hold it up, but then we'll be running in battens. So same as the wall, we're gonna have this nice service void below our vapor barrier, uh, which is basically, we'll tape up those boards. And then we'll just be able to run cables up for all these light fittings. Uh, if we wanted to, we could run spots in there. We, all, all of those options become available. And finally, let's, let's hear it in the comments. What is your go-to method for cutting insulation? I'll tell you what, uh, the quickest thing is gonna be a handsaw, but the messiest. And if you'd seen when we did the loft conversion, uh, I mean, I was, you got your goggles on because the dust in the air, you've got a big respirator on because it's just horrible stuff. It's all over the floor. So even cleaning up is an absolute nightmare and it get, just gets airborne. If you try and do anything outside, it's just horrible because it obviously just blows away. So that's the saw. You can use all sorts of purpose-made insulation saws that are less serrated. The pizza cutter, I reckon if, I tell you what, when we come to do the 25 mil and 50 mil layers, that is the answer because that would go through in one. So you wouldn't have to do that flip over because that's what added the time. You wouldn't have to do any scoring and snapping because it would go through. I think it gives about a 50 mil cut, that deep pan cutter. <laughs> I was going to put it in our tool affiliates tool list, but it seems a bit odd. But I will try and find the link to this one. It seems to have held up well. It was a commercial, a catering grade one. So you would hope it would, it would last the uh, project. Other options. I mean, originally I thought, oh, because there are repeat cuts, I'll set the table saw up with a load of extraction and just bang them through. But again, the table saw wouldn't hit 100 mil. You can get all sorts of expensive power tools like from Festool or different blades for reciprocating saws and um, jigsaws. I'm yet to try any of those. And obviously the tool themselves are quite expensive. Um, I think having a jig is the, the biggest time saver, whether it's like that or whether it's up on a table, that's gonna help. Anything without a serrated blade seems to be the way to go. This does just drive through. And believe it or not, just before off camera, for the last one, <laughs> I didn't use the pizza cutter. I had my jig on there and I used the floor scraper. This thing is pretty razor sharp. It's very thin, it's probably the thinner than the pizza cutter. And it's got a slightly deeper cut, um, or a deeper, it gave a deeper cut. I was able to just stand on the board, walk back and it just sliced straight through it. So that's quite a good way to, to do it. You could be quite creative, I guess. Maybe you could grind the teeth off a blade. I don't know. Anyway, hopefully we haven't got too much more of this to do in the future. Anyway, thanks to the family for their help. We should have this wrapped up this week. As soon as I get the sun, I'm getting back up on that roof, hopefully with Craig, because uh, two of us is always gonna be safer passing those sheets around. We've got one side done now. I will give you a very quick sneak peek now of that. Uh, it's looking really good, loving it. And as you can hear, it's absolutely hammering it down. There's no chance of any water getting through this side. This side, mm, a little bit hesitant. I reckon it could drive up under the membrane, but no drips yet. If you wanna check out any more insulation videos, I'll try and find a playlist and we'll put it on the screen now for you. Other than that, we'll see you in the next video. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss anything. Thanks to these lovely people over here for supporting us over on Patreon and thank you to Speedy for sponsoring this series. Thanks for watching. Remember, if you can, do it yourself and we'll see you next time. All right, let's go home.